U.S. leaders moan incessantly about how other governments should treat their own people. America's moral superiority is routinely touted as why the U.S. is legitimate to intervene in the affairs of others around the world. Time and again, they pull out the human rights card to admonish the human rights abuses in other countries, justifying sanctions, bombing campaigns, or invasions to overthrow their governments. The U.S. is the most qualified to do this, of course, because it is the shining moral example for how society should be run. Yet 2.2 million people sit rotting in American jails, 7 million in the prison system, counting probation and parole, astronomically higher in absolute numbers and per capita than in any other country in the world. The U.S. has only 5% of the world's population, yet a stunning 25% of its prisoners, meaning one out of every 100 people in America is living behind bars. With a prison population so enormous in a country that's the global arbitrator of human rights, it must be leading with a great example of what prison should be. So what are conditions like in these so-called correctional facilities? Prisoners aren't just warehoused in the millions. They're packed on top of each other like animals. At the end of 2010, the Federal Bureau of Prisons was operating at 36% over capacity on average. California prisons are 144% of capacity. And Alabama, the most overcrowded prison state, sits at 195% of capacity. In 2009, one prison in the heart of Dixie was overflowing at 319% of capacity. Even the Supreme Court has deemed prison overcrowding cruel and unusual punishment. Cramped conditions may be livable, but extreme temperatures are deadly. This year, a homeless veteran at Rikers Prison baked to death in a cell that exceeded 100 degrees. In Texas, at least 14 inmates have died due to extreme heat since 2007, with cells averaging 90 and reaching upwards of 130 degrees. Even the most basic human survival needs are choked. Despite huge budgets, prisons strive to allocate only the minimum food required and of the lowest quality spending about one-third feeding inmates what it should cost for a basic nutritional diet. In some cases, prisoners are literally starving. According to the Southern Center for Human Rights, inmates in one Georgia jail are fed only two meager portions of food a day, up to 14 hours apart, resorting them to eat syrup packets, toothpaste, and toilet paper for sustenance. Even more disturbing are incidents like the one at Rikers this past March where 22 prisoners became violently ill after eating meatloaf laced with rat poison. A prison is not just hell on earth for inmates. It's also hell for the families and loved ones of anyone incarcerated. Extreme difficulty in visiting prison aside, the system even makes talking near impossible. In addition to severe restrictions on communications, prisoners are also charged exorbitant dollar a minute fees. The telephone service providers kick back 42% of their massive revenue to the state, amounting to $152 million annually. Two dozen Texas jails have already eliminated in-person visits altogether, replacing them with expensive video chat services. Incarcerated people are also subject to savage brutality from the only people from the outside they're allowed to see. Extreme violence from prison guards is widespread, although done hidden behind walls, knowing that their actions will rarely, if ever, be scrutinized. A survey at Clinton Correctional Facility found that 90% reported common physical assaults by staff for even the most minor infractions. The report also corroborates what others have found across the country, that people will be brutally beaten, thrown back in their cells without medical attention, and threatened with more violence if they seek medical attention. If wounds are too severe, it's no worry to the guard, because routinely the medical staff will cover up for them. 
In some cases, guards were even found to be forcing inmates to fight in gladiator-like tournaments. Well, the most subtle form of brutality in the prison system is the denial of medical attention. Uh, prisoners get hurt, prisoners need medicine, uh, sometimes the medicine is a week delayed and, it, and a person might have high blood pressure and need to take the medicine on a daily uh, uh, basis and it might take them a week, two weeks or a month. Uh, it certainly damages organs. Uh, the, uh, the most inexpensive health care providers are used. Uh, anybody that can make the cost of health care for prisoners uh, uh, at the lowest, they, they get the contracts, and of course it's very abusive. It's not just physical violence. In 2014, the Bureau of Justice reported that prison guards account for half of all sexual assault allegations, and that it was extremely rare for any of them to go to trial for the accused crime. Of the guards who are caught sexually abusing prisoners, one third are allowed to resign before the investigation concludes, eliminating any public record. One of the guards' most important jobs is making sure everyone's put to work, all day, every day, making pennies on the dollar for corporate America. The country's biggest corporations, McDonald's, Walmart, American Airlines, and others, line their pockets with outsourced prison labor to manufacture everything from food to furniture to staffing call centers. Inmate worker safety is outweighed by their utility to be used as corporate props, like when BP used prisoners to stage gulf cleanup photos. State governments have also found ways to cut costs by replacing good paying sought after careers with cheap prison labor. A stunning 30 to 40% of all California's firefighters are prisoners, making a measly $2 a day or $2 an hour when on the line. Producing two billion in annual value, inmates are a hot commodity for corporate masters who only wish their minimum wage of 12 cents an hour could be applied to the entire nation. In America's prisons, lives are not just profit-making tools, they're also expendable. There is no humane way to kill someone, period. Realizing this, every other industrialized country in the world has banned the death penalty. But exceptional America refuses to abandon this barbaric practice. The Wild West logic goes, if you kill someone, you deserve to die. But the murky truth reveals that 18 people facing the death penalty have been exonerated through DNA evidence since 1989. According to the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, at least one in 25 inmates on death row are innocent. There's more than one way to kill a man who's locked up. After America's torture became public record, US leaders have vowed to ban it for good, again. But the empire regularly tortures people every day within its own borders. See, empires used to torture their prisoners in underground dark dungeons. Yet over a century later, they're tortured just the same in sanitized bright boxes. Imagine the quality of life spent inside a windowless, concrete, six by nine foot cell for 23 hours a day for years on end in a room no bigger than a king size mattress. The only human interaction you have is with the guard who slips you food through a slit. At Red Onion State Prison, 75% of inmates are on 23-hour lockdown in tiny cells for an average of three years. In Texas, inmates placed in solitary have to earn their way back to the general prison population, spending on average five years in isolation. This kind of detachment has devastating psychological impacts. Not only does it exacerbate mental illness, in many cases, perfectly healthy prisoners develop extreme psychological disorders as a result. According to the ACLU, people subjected to solitary confinement exhibit a variety of negative physiological reactions, including hypersensitivity, hallucinations, increased anxiety and nervousness, lack of impulse control, severe and chronic depression, appetite loss and weight loss, heart palpitations, talking to oneself, problems sleeping, confusing thought processes, self-mutilation, lower levels of brain function, including a decline in EEG activity after only seven days in solitary. Yet the US loves to use it, despite international human rights bodies widely recognizing the practice as torture. 
Often we hear that the people in prison are violent criminals who need to be locked away to keep the country safe. But when you take a look at who's actually behind bars, a much more disturbing reality begins to unfold. Despite lecturing the world about the inexcusable offense of holding political prisoners, the U.S. has its own stockpile of them. Thousands of political activists were imprisoned during COINTELPRO, and from its inception until today, the U.S. continues to unjustly arrest political leaders to silence them. There's a lot. There's, the numbers vary, uh, but it, some people agree that it's around 200. But in terms of Black Panther Party members, which I was one, uh, there's probably uh, almost two dozen prisoners. But there's Native Americans, there's Puerto Ricans, there's uh, uh, European uh, organizers. And then the now today the environmentalists and other people that have been organizing for the last two or three decades have also joined the ranks of political prisoners. Well, it's very difficult to organize in prisons. It's easier to engage in uh, negative activity. Once you start organizing, there's a, a concerted effort by prison officials to transfer you, to get you out of prison. They move you around, they harass you, they uh, 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 find ways in which to put you on lockup to keep you in solitary confinement. Uh, they will remove all your books. They will constantly shake your cell down. So organizing in the prison is a, a very difficult task, but a lot of young people, once they develop a consciousness and a sense of awareness, or once they just decide they don't want to be treated as animals, they uh, endure the hardships that's involved. Beyond targeting activists, masses of average Americans like you and me are wrapped up in the albatross of prison. With the prison population skyrocketing over the last several decades, you would think it would correlate to the level of crime, but the opposite is true. Crime has actually dropped dramatically over the past 25 years, while numbers sent to prison have increased at an inverse rate. The bursting prison population also carries heavy examples of institutional racism in America. Despite making up only 12% of the population, African Americans constitute 39% of the prison population. The facts are irrefutable. If you're Black or Latino, you are more likely to be sentenced to prison than your white counterparts. In fact, African American men are seven times more likely, Latino men three times more likely to go to prison than a white man. Among federal defendants, black men receive 20% longer sentences than white counterparts committing the same crime with similar records. And what great threat do these people pose to society that warns them being locked away in federal penitentiaries, mostly using drugs? Over 50% serving time in federal prison are nonviolent drug-related offenders, and since 1998 have constituted the largest portion fed into federal prison. Between 2012 and 2013, 28% of drug offenders had charges related to marijuana only. But on top of throwing people in cells for victimless crimes, the state has also ensured a way to throw minor offenders away forever. Thanks to draconian three strikes laws, there are currently at least 3,278 people serving life without parole for nonviolent crimes. Some of them as absurd as shoplifting to jacking a wallet. In a tragic 79% of these cases, where people's lives are trapped in the system forever, involve nonviolent drug offenses. The US prison system doesn't just illustrate white supremacy embedded in the empire, but patriarchy too. One California prison study found that of all the women behind bars for killing their significant other, 93% were abused by that person, and 67% killed their significant other while defending themselves and their children from life-threatening attacks from their abuser. Self-defense, even without a victim, is punished. In the case of Marissa Alexander, the victim of repeated abuse was given 20 years in prison for simply firing a warning shot in the air while her abuser was trying to kill her. After public outcry won her an appeal, the prosecutor tried to increase the sentence to 60 years. Then there's the refusal to recognize the existence and rights of trans women by misgendering them, therefore placing them in extreme danger. In general, 4% report sexual abuse while in prison, but that number shoots to 59% for trans women. 
Harrowing stats aside, the Empire defends mass incarceration with the mantra that those in prison are there by their own doing. We all make our own decisions. But what about those who can't? In the belly of the Empire, how are the most vulnerable treated? Including people medically deemed unable to care for themselves. People with debilitating mental illness like bipolar, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, and more. They're discarded, thrown on the streets, and punished in cells. In testimony before Congress in 2010, Ohio Governor Ted Strickland estimated upwards of 40% of mentally ill people in America become wrapped up in the criminal justice system. Right now, there are 10 times as many people with mental illness in prison than in hospital care. The trend of mental illness is startlingly high across the board. In federal prison, inmates with diagnosed mental health issues consist of 45% of the population. In state prisons, it's even higher, 56%, and a whopping 64% of inmates have mental illness in local jails. But this cruelty and neglect isn't just endured by mentally ill adults. It's extended to the even more vulnerable, children. For example, the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections estimates 35% of jailed youth suffer mental illness with 50% on psychotropic drugs. However, the mentally ill aren't just left to languish in prison. They're also executed. Since 1983, at least 60 people with mental illness or retardation have been killed by the state. The system has been shown to be stacked against poor people, regardless of race. Even though drug use is comparable, police aren't looking for drugs in Beverly Hills. Poor neighborhoods are the most heavily policed and the most routinely harassed. And once you're arrested, you only get the best justice money can buy. A great secret of this so-called justice system is that the right to be tried before a jury of their peers is hardly the norm. Most are pressured by fear and coercion to take plea deals, told they're gonna be found guilty anyway. More than 90% of criminal cases are never tried before a jury. Others go to jail not for jailable offenses, but for the inability to pay fines and court fees. A 2010 Brennan Center report found that of the 15 states with the largest prison populations, all had a practice of arresting people because they were unable to afford fines. For example, Ferguson's nearly all-white police force pull over African Americans in mass and slap them with expensive tickets, whether or not they commit traffic violations. Unable to pay, residents are sent into the pipeline of the prison system for two weeks or more. In 2013, the city issued 33,000 arrest warrants for unpaid traffic tickets. Ferguson has a population of 21,000. Many remain in the system because they can't afford bail. Like Khalif Broder, who sat in jail for three long years for the crime of stealing a backpack at age 16 because he was unable to pay the $3,000 bail. He ended up committing suicide as a result of abuse. At Rikers, an insane 40% of inmates are there because they cannot afford to make bail. But at least the system throws the gauntlet down on all crimes equally. Actually, if you have money, you can get away with pretty much anything. Robert Richards IV, billionaire heir to the DuPont fortune, found guilty in 2009 of raping his three-year-old daughter. How many years in prison did he receive for this heinous offense? None. The judge said he, quote, wouldn't fare well in prison. Let him go home on probation instead. Beyond individuals, though, an entire clique is exempt from prosecution. Bank of America, Western Union, J.P. Morgan Chase, and HSBC are known to be laundering billions in drug money for cartels in Mexico. While millions of poor people are funneled in and out of the prison system for possession of small amounts of drugs, Banks openly engage in flagrant criminal drug activity to the point of making the drug trade possible without fear of any real punishment. Racism and inequality in the justice system don't happen in a vacuum. The economic function American prisons serve cannot be overlooked when we want to understand how the freest country on earth ended up with the most prisoners. I sat down with Eugene per year author of Shackled and Chained, to talk about the roots of mass incarceration and how it evolved in U.S. society. 
Well, I think that what we have to understand about prisons in the United States is that they're ultimately a form of social control. They're an element that exists as a broader part of the economy that helps discipline the labor force. And so when you think about slavery, for instance, and the things that came after it, it's sort of a three-step process for the African-American population in particular in America. So on the one hand, you have Africans who are brought here, amalgamated from a number of different ethnicities, peoples, nations, so on and so forth, molded into one people. And really, when you look at the development of the prison system in America, in the South, prisons were very underdeve underdeveloped because primarily slavery was the institution that was used to control labor, to control where people were living, where they went, uh, how they traveled, the security system, the patrollers, sometimes called patty rollers at that time, that were all policing the population that existed at that time. That was the primary labor force, the servile labor force. Then following the end of slavery, what you have after a brief flourishing of reconstruction is <clears throat> this new system called Jim Crow. And Jim Crow used things like convict leasing, which was a small amount of the individual, in terms of the individuals who were involved, but in terms of the role that it played, it was for African Americans who were still needed to be this major agricultural labor force, cotton, indigo, so on and so forth, that really was the pivot of the world capitalist economy. They couldn't just have people going wherever they wanted, leaving the plantation, doing whatever they can do. So on the one hand, you see that there's no land reform during Reconstruction. On the other hand, that you see that the laws that were pe getting people swept up into this convict leasing were primarily around quote unquote vagrancy or things of that nature. Essentially, if you weren't employed or people thought you were doing something suspicious, you could be picked up and thrown into these labor gangs that existed that were, you know, in the mines primarily, also in the railroads and a lot of the new industry in the South. And so you can see that the role of convict leasing, which was the early development of the prison system as such in the Southern part of the country, is almost 100% aimed towards controlling labor. And when we look at our current system of mass incarceration, we have to look at the fact that at the same time you see prisons exploding, you see a big changeover that's happening in terms of the economy in America, and mass incarceration, militarized policing, and things of that nature become a, an institution that is existing as a band-aid, because you've already decided we're going to economically devastate communities. And instead of doing things that are going to help people, what we have to do is ring fence and control the social conditions that are arising from this that create a number of different problems. Eugene, in your book you say that, quote, sections of the population have been rendered superfluous to the normal productive process. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, what I meant by that is when you see what's happening with this economic crisis, the question is, what is the answer going to be? And so not only do you start to blame poor people more for the problem and cut back on social programs and the like, but to restore the rate of profit, what the capitalist class, the ruling class, the 1%, whatever you want to call them, in this country decided to do was globalize the chain of production and start to move factories, the so-called runaway factory movement, first to the south and the so-called Sun Belt, the southwest California, where labor was cheaper, and more importantly, where labor laws were completely weakened, and then after that, on to Latin America, on to Asia, and the process that many of us know as quote unquote globalization was really a search for the cheapest possible form of labor to reduce the cost to increase the rate of profit. And so not only do you have jobs moving away in the general sense, but you have a rise in structural unemployment that is having a huge effect. And if people look at, for example, the employment to population ratio, which is really the best way to look at how many people are employed, it's very interesting to look at the peak level, which starts in 1979, and you start to see it just steadily going down till today. And I think that's a powerful statement about the fact that not only are jobs leaving, but we need fewer people to work. And so what you have is a whole population of people that you've said, okay, we told you that we were going to integrate you into the economy, uh, black people, the same way we did Irish and Italians, but we're not going to do that. We're going to send these jobs somewhere else. And on the same token, we're also not going to provide a lot of social programs and things of that nature. So you have a whole population of people who are existing in this area who aren't really needed in the production process besides how they become used in the low-wage workforce, but they're still there. And these are the exact same communities that just 20 years previously, if we're talking, say, 1980, had risen up in this mass uprising that had happened in these major northern cities. When you look at the wave 
of major drug epidemics in America. Let's just speak about crack cocaine. Crack cocaine really comes on the scene at the depth of the economic crisis of the early 1980s that really was devastating to black communities across this country. And so you see when people have no hope, when they see no future, and then they're driven to look for more and more ways to escape. And when you start to have the explosion of this black market economy, all the other social consequences that exist from this social devastation, you have to find some way to contain it if you aren't going to solve it. And talk about the mandatory minimums and three strikes laws. What forces were behind these and what damage did they do? Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting question. So you see a, start, a, a number of Democrats, so-called liberals, start to reach for these conservative solutions that speak to punitive type things. Well, if the problem isn't the government institutions, if the problem is these poor people, we need to start to look for punitive measures that can change their behavior. And so they start to push mandatory minimums. But it doesn't become a big thing until the war on drugs. And what you see then is the connection between the two. They were pushing mandatory minimums before the war on drugs. The war on drugs became the kindling on the fire. This issue of social control is very clear. They're making the laws and organizing them in a way that is deliberately aimed at putting people in a certain geographic area which are racially and class exclusive black poor people, putting them in the noose and sweeping them into the prison system. Conditions in the empire's prisons have always been horrific and people incarcerated, along with their supporters on the outside, have always organized together to change them. In 1971, the Attica uprising in the San Quentin prison forced the government and prison authorities to take the prisoners' demands seriously and succeeded in winning real reforms. Despite the fact that the fascist-like prison forces sent their foot soldiers to wantonly slaughter 29 prison organizers, with so little care that they also killed 10 hostages in the massacre, the Attica Rebellion lit a fire that has never gone out, and 2013 saw the biggest prison strike possibly in world history, where tens of thousands of California inmates came together to protest poor nutrition, torturous use of solitary confinement, and more. In less than a week, the strike spread to 24 state prisons and four out-of-state contract facilities where inmates refuse to eat, perform work assignments, or attend required classes. As a result, state lawmakers were forced to hold public hearings on conditions in maximum security prisons and the prevalent use of solitary confinement. Hope can come from such an ugly disease. The empire has exposed that these structures exist for nothing but to maintain its power and wealth while wasting the potential of so many millions of human beings, so many young people, so many in need who deserve to be part of society. If prisoners under the most severe repression can organize coordinated political actions across more than a dozen high security prisons, imagine what we can do on the outside to build solidarity to end mass incarceration. The fact that history's biggest empire also has history's biggest prison system highly militarized police and a mass surveillance grid is no coincidence. It's an acknowledgement that the biggest threat to the empire's rule are its own people, awake and using their agency to fight it.